Minister Stewart. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And if I could begin by paying a huge tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Leicester East. For as long as I have been in the House, and for long before I entered this House, he has been a great champion of the interests of Yemen. He understands it, of course, as he has pointed out himself, from his own early childhood, and he brings a level of knowledge and passion to this, which is very, very important within this House. It is a horrible tragedy, as everybody here on both sides of the House has emphasised, tragedy in which nearly 80 per cent of the population of Yemen currently face a humanitarian crisis in which over one million children are facing a shortage of food, and of those, almost 400,000 children literally struggle to know where the next meal will come from. If I could just take a couple of moments to try to talk a little bit, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the causes and origins of this conflict, because I think it is important in addressing this conflict to have a look at those causes. When I last visited Yemen, which was in the spring of 2014, we were looking at a situation in which, despite all the underlying fragility of that country, so despite the fact that there were considerable south-north divides, despite the sectarian splits between Houthis and other members of Yemeni society, despite the extreme poverty of that country, the national dialogue seemed to be working. There was a remarkable period of relative stability between 2011 and 2014. I'd like to pay tribute to bin Umar, who was the UN representative at the time, to the extraordinary work, in fact, of the ambassadors, the GCC ambassadors, the EU ambassador, for example, who'd served in Afghanistan and spoke fluent Arabic, the US ambassador, who was a fluent Arabist, the French ambassador, who spoke fluent Arabic. But, unfortunately, despite all the work that was done in 2014, very rapidly the situation deteriorated so that by the beginning of 2015 we found ourselves facing the horror that we see today. And I think there are certain lessons that we need to draw from that, both to understand how we went wrong, Mr Deputy Speaker, and also to solve the conflicts in the future. The first central thing, of course, is to apportion blame. And we cannot shy away from the fact that at the core of this conflict is the action of ex-President Saleh and the Houthis. They attacked the legitimate government in Sana'a, and they themselves propagated this conflict. But there is a broader context that surrounds this, which we also, as the international community, need to take responsibility for and recognise. Clearly, that national dialogue, Mr Deputy Speaker, which I saw in 2014, did not do what it was supposed to do in retrospect. It focused too much, in the end, on an elite in Sana'a. It did not reach out enough to the rural populations. It was not genuinely inclusive. It left a situation in which the Houthi, in particular, felt that the federal deal offered to them was unfair, that the area that they had been allocated was too small, and they did not have access to the sea. Again, international development actors, partly through the pressure on President Hardy to reduce the fuel subsidies, helped, although a lot of the responsibility must lie with President Hardy himself and the way he implemented this, to create a situation in which instability was encouraged by the cutting of those fuel subsidies. Corruption, too, in Sana'a and Yemen was a huge mobiliser of popular resentment against that government, and that was not adequately addressed. Yeah. Please. Thank you for his kind comments, and he is giving a very impressive exposition of, of, of what went wrong. Uh, does he think that we should have done more at the time, because we are great supporters of Yemen and so were the Americans, uh, to try and monitor the situation and try and move that dialogue in the right direction? Uh, do you think we left, we withdrew far too early? Um, I, I thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I think I would like to pay tribute to Jane Marriott, who was our ambassador at the time, and to the work that was done by John Wilkes, her predecessor and indeed from the diffid work that took place behind the scenes at the time. These are very difficult things, and I'm not in the business of second-guessing officials, but I think the lesson we should draw from all these conflicts is, above all, the one lesson I pointed to, which is we need to be very cautious as an international community not to become over-optimistic and to be very aware of the ways in which talking to an elite in a capital and engaging with the civil society in Sana'a misled us about the real resentments that existed in the countryside. Now, 
The question, however, is how do we now address this? And central to this is understanding that, in fact, it was Saleh's own, ex-President Saleh's own policy for decades which underlie the problems that we face today. He deliberately exacerbated those tribal divisions. He deliberately created that culture of corruption and impunity, which he is now so expertly exploiting in order to maintain instability in that country. But we cannot be naive here. Simply removing ex-President Saleh is not going to solve this problem on its own. The problems in Yemen go much deeper than that and need to be addressed systematically from politics through to the humanitarian dimension. So if I can just touch on those two things. Politics. Now, as the Right Honourable Member for Leicester East has pointed out, Mr Deputy Speaker, politics is at the centre of this. Politics, politics, politics. He has asked ten questions. Uh, Characteristically of the Honourable Member for Lesteries, ten questions which I have to deal with in less than ten minutes, and I will try to deal with them quite quickly before moving on. Largely, Mr Deputy Speaker, you will notice his ten questions have focused on what I would call the high politics and diplomacy, and I'll try to address them one by one and then take it into the bigger issue of the solution to the Yemeni conflict. So he asked firstly, what is the UK's position in relation to the Q8 talks? Well, the answer there is the Q8 talks were talks which were held, Mr Deputy Speaker, between the parties in the conflict, in other words, the regional players and the Yemenis themselves. But yes, certainly, the UK ambassador to Yemen was present, was in the room, but in a diplomatic capacity, not as a party to the conflict. Secondly, he asked what support we are providing to Saudi Arabia. Now, of course, the current operations are Saudi-led. The United Kingdom is not embedded in the Saudi military operations. However, as the Minister, uh, as my honourable friend, uh, the, the Under Secretary of the Foreign Office, pointed out in his statement today, we are very, very clear that the investigation, as he stated, needs to be led in the first instance by the Saudi government, as indeed similar investigations of the United States or United Kingdom governments for actions taking place in Afghanistan and Iraq were led first and foremost by those governments. If that investigation is not adequate, the Minister himself has said he will then look again. Thank you. Point. Um, the Saudi Foreign Minister told us yesterday, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that um, the UK had provided both technical and personnel support to investigations for the last six to eight months, and also advice had been provided in targeting. As one of the guardians of the humanitarian principle, could the Minister be clear about what support has been provided by DFID specifically in relation to investigating violations of humanitarian law? Minister. Very, very happy to provide more detail, but in essence, we currently provide two forms of support, and I'll elaborate on this in a written answer. We provide training and capacity support, which includes statements about international humanitarian law, but that is not about this military operation, that is in general for the Royal Saudi Air Force. And secondly, my own department uh, and the Honourable Minister's department have worked together through the UN process on international humanitarian law, in particular in a meeting in Geneva last month, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is partly in response to the question raised by the Right Honourable Member for Leicester East, where we are pushing for more staffing for the independent UN investigation on human rights through the OHCR and in particular through its Yemen office. Fourthly, he asked a question around arms sales. We take arms sales very seriously. As members of this House are aware on both sides, the Cake Committee report was uh, divided, but we continue to monitor very, very carefully all actions of international humanitarian law, although that is not a prime responsibility of my department. He asked whether we would be in the room for peace talks. Absolutely. Our current ambassador, Edmund Fitton Brown, is very, very close to the UN representative. And so long as these are not talks taking place between the parties to the conflict, the, UN, the UK is present in a diplomatic capacity. He asked whether the Prime Minister would be prepared to call King Salman of Saudi Arabia and President Hadi. Well, of course, he is aware that the Foreign Secretary met on Sunday, as he mentioned, with the Saudi Foreign Minister. But more than that, the Saudi Foreign Minister came to this House yesterday, came to this House of Commons yesterday to be directly accountable to this Parliament. And indeed, my honourable friend himself met with President Hadi in a visit, spoke to President Hadi in a visit to Saudi Arabia last week. He asked about sanctions. Well, of course, we will continue to put pressure on all parties to this conflict to support the current peace. And he asked whether we are providing support for the Special Envoy. The answer, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
is the UK government is currently providing over £1 million of direct support for the staff of Ismail Ud Sheikh Ahmed, who is the UN Special Envoy to Yemen. If in the remaining minutes, though, I can talk about the broader context, in addition to all the very good ten points which have been raised by the Right Honourable Member Lester East, we need to look at politics at the local and regional level. This is, must be a first that a minister has given a set of questions and replies to every one of them. <laughs> I don't think I've ever come across this in my 29 years in this House. Well done. Could he address the issue of the ceasefire? We know we've got 72 hours. Can we please try and make sure it's longer? 72 hours is not enough. I know there's a lot of other things to talk about, but that ceasefire is critical. Um, we absolutely agree that it's critical. We absolutely agree that 72 hours in and of itself is not enough. But as the Right Honourable Member for Leicester East is so aware, the only way in which we do any kind of peace or conflict resolution all the way from sub-Saharan Africa right the way through to the peace and the conflict in Cambodia is starting with small steps. It's vital to begin with these 72-hour moves. That's why the UN Special Envoy has done it. That's why ourselves in the United States are strongly supportive of it. And we will, of course, be doing all we can to extend that ceasefire because we do indeed need longer. And indeed, what we want is a permanent political settlement in place, which brings me to the broader question of politics. So there are two dimensions to that. We need to acknowledge that this is taking place in a broader peninsula context, but we also need to acknowledge that lasting peace will only come if we actually address the local level conflicts, the local level conflicts taking place on the ground in Yemen. And our humanitarian response, this is a debate about the humanitarian crisis, needs to take that into account. And I think I want to make three brief observations on the nature of DFID's humanitarian response, Mr Deputy Speaker. The first is that we need to approach this with some degree of humility. The Right Honourable Member for Leicester East has quite rightly pointed to the important role that the United Kingdom plays. We do indeed hold the pen at the Security Council. We have indeed put in £100 million into this. And indeed, it is true that we play an important role in the Quad. But we are not the only people here, and we cannot act as though we are. We have to make sure that we acknowledge the role of the United States, the role of Saudi Arabia, the role of other states such as Oman, but above all, the role of the Yemeni people themselves. The only real solution here is going to come from the Yemeni people themselves. We need to acknowledge again that although the United Kingdom has put in £100 million, the current UN appeal is only 47% met. We were very pleased at the UN General Assembly to raise another £50 million from other partners, but we still need to do much more. We also need to make sure, therefore, that at the moment we cannot adequately, as an international community, address all the 21 million people who are currently at risk. So we need to prioritise. We need to make sure we focus on the most vulnerable people. We need to prioritise, firstly, the protection of civilians. Secondly, making absolutely sure that we focus on food security. It is an absolute tragedy that we are getting to extremes of malnutrition, and we need to make sure that that doesn't turn into a famine. And thirdly, we need to make absolutely certain, whenever we are dealing with anyone in Yemen, that we look at preventable disease. It is a tragedy that cholera is now breaking out in Sana'a. Commerce and shipping is going to be absolutely central, getting the markets working getting the ships into Yemen, understanding this is not just the development and humanitarian response. If I can finish by paying tribute to the honourable member, right honourable member for Leicester East, but also to the very, very strong work, both of the UK government, but also of the UN Special Envoy Ismail Sheikh Ahmed, and also to the extraordinary work of the humanitarian organisations, pay tribute to the very difficult circumstances under which they work the suffering that Mercy Corps has experienced, that ICRC has experienced, that Médecins Sans Frontières has experienced, and above all, that Yemenis, not just internationals, the Yemenis who are bearing the burden of this, who are out in those field offices, who are delivering aid in some of the most testing conditions on earth. I think if we can plan now for the medium to long term, think hard about the stabilisation, think hard about the politics that is at the root of this, ensure that we get the economic framework in place so that if we're lucky enough to have a ceasefire, we are really able to move to a situation in which we have a sustainable economy in Yemen for the future, then I believe if we can sometimes do less than we pretend, we can do much more than we fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah.